maybe two. You know, you're not gonna make me out to look bad, are you? There's so many f***ing murders. Okay. Actually, there's Let's really jump. not. He only had like 14 victims. That's a loss, Arena. And we Elizabeth don't even know. Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory. <laughs> that lady oh, had. Okay. <laughs> 14 is nothing. Okay, compared to her, you, you would have you to be off an entire city just to <laughs> top her. We had a camera malfunction, but uh, we're alive. We're <laughs> back. Yeah, we're back. We're still kicking. <laughs> And welcome back to another episode of Sinister Sunday. All of you lovely creeps and creepettes, I hope you are ready because we are going to be discussing the Night Stalker, Mr. Richard Ramirez. Um, I mean, this was another guy with another traumatic childhood. I, his father oh. uh, well, I brain fart because I knew was that. prone I, to, uh, you know, the anger and physical abuse and then just his cousin. Oh my goodness. Miguel Ramirez did a number on Richard. Like there was an incident that happened when he was about 12 year old, 12 years old that I think shaped his life. He his cousin Mike uh, was married to a woman. He the cousin was a Vietnam vet and suffering from PTSD and he uh, in front of Richard, he shot and killed uh, this woman and then told Richard to keep his mouth shut. R which Richard did, but it didn't this kid was so impressionable at the age of 12 and his cousin was just like, let Didn't me shoot? just show you these pictures and stuff. And killed his fiance or wife right in front of him. Yeah. He Kay. killed his wife in front of Richard. Yeah. With a 38 caliber over an argument. Mike for doing this killing, only got, uh, you know, a couple of months uh, in prison because he pled innocent by reason of insanity. And once the doctors determined he was cured, they let him loose. Well, when he got out, he started sharing with Richard some pictures that he had brought back from Vietnam, pictures of gruesomely decapitated Vietnamese women uh, who'd engaged in sex acts with him. Uh, and of course, that just fueled this passion that Richard had. Miguel was showing him Polaroids and photos from when he was in the Vietnam War because he was a decorated Green Beret, which blows my mind that you can be a decorated Green Beret, but yet have Polaroids of your victims and talk about your exploits and the fact that you raped the Vietnamese women. You posed with a severed head of one of the women you abused. Like, come sick. on, man. This That's kid was sick. 12. That is sick. That's only when you're older than my son. That is sick. Right. It's crazy to see, yeah, like what he was exposed to compared to like being a parent now of a kid who is only a, a year younger. Richard Ramirez was exposed to at 12. That's just, that blows my mind that his parents, like they're not active. They're not there. Like, okay. His dad was an immigrant. Uh, mother had been born in Colorado, but kind of an immigrant too. Um, they, the, the fan, he was the youngest of uh, five kids. He had an older sister and three older brothers. Okay. Literally, that is a shit show waiting to happen, which it did. <laughs> it did. Yeah, and no kidding. So let's go through. So he was born February 28th, 1960. And February 29th. Oh, really? I'm on crime investigation. Oh, crime investigation. <laughs> Stop. Don't even with. <laughs> Because it's okay. The reason why I said that is because it's split the hell up on the website. It says crime and then it does investi and then under it's gation. So I didn't put that together, okay? You're um, like, honestly, yeah. No, if you I am just not. search his date of birth, it comes up as the 29th. Okay. So okay. maybe they just credit that because it's a leap year. <gasps> oh, yeah. So, um, he was born. On a leap year. Born on a leap year. This guy was talking about how he was born on a leap year. And then uh, was he always thought he was like this special whatever. That he was like the special demonic thing. And they even like. Like he had that in his head. Right? Like a narcissistic way of looking at things. Like uh, he was a special agent of the devil. Weird off the wall mentality. Um, it was believed that his mom was exposed to 
like battery acids or some tor types of like acids or chemicals or something like that. Yeah. What do I think happened with Ramirez? How did he become this way? Well, he was exposed to a number of negative elements. And I know this happens to a lot of people. But with Ramirez, what really stands out is just how young he was when these factors started influencing him. We see toxic chemicals in utero, the concussions at age 2 and age 5, using marijuana at age 10, the disturbing photographs and stories from his older cousin Mike at age 12, witnessing a homicide at age 13. It seems like he just didn't have a chance. If one factor didn't cause trouble for him, another factor would have. Supposedly, yeah. um, when she was pregnant with him, so they're not sure, but they didn't really get to link that. But there is that theory uh, as to why he might be a little hoo-hoo in the hoo-hoo. But he also, like, did drugs and stuff like that. And well, so, he's also had a lot of head damage and stuff, too. Right. The swing. Before that, there was something. He came about to start murdering, and he went on a murder spree, right? He just, like, it wasn't spread out. Like some of these murders, they'll spread, they'll like, maybe they'll spread it out or be really secretive, but they were like, nah, two in one night kind of thing sometimes. Okay. I uh, have his head injuries. Oh, what is it? Um, it? Once I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, light bulb. So he had two major head injuries, the hit by the swing that you discussed. And then the one that I was trying to remember, but. I've had so much coffee. My brain's working faster than anything well, else wants to. But I uh, though, either when he was two, he developed a contusion on his head after sustaining an injury caused by a dresser falling on him. He actually received over 30 stitches for that. Yikes. And then Ooh. when he was six, he was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And suffered from grand mal seizures. So the dresser and the swing definitely did a big number on his brain. Yeah. or And or did not help. Right. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So some of the, uh, like, if we want to talk about the documentary, he smashed an older lady's head in. And and then what he uh, would break in windows, he shot a woman, but uh, ended up hitting her keys out of like strange occurrence. Uh, so she lived, and then uh, he went proceeded to go in the house and killed her, the other person in the house. And then he walked out, and the chick that he shot and that she made it out alive, she goes, "You already shot me." And then he just walked, kept just, he didn't even do anything. He just like kept on walking. Weird. He's just so odd. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he ever really went into these situations knowing exactly. Like, you would think some of them, like Bundy and maybe Gacy, maybe even Dahmer, like, went into the situation just kind of knowing their plan. But I feel like Ramirez just... He was spur of the moment, like in the moment kind of thing. He didn't exactly go into these situations knowing he was going to pull extension cords from alarm clocks or lamps and tie these women or men up with these things. I think it was just a lot of in the moment, whatever fit the moment. That's why some situations he robbed someone, some situations he raped someone, some situations he raped and killed. I mean, he was even so comfortable in some of these situations that he would eat snacks and stuff in their homes. And I was just like, dude, come on. Like, you have to yeah. be seriously comfortable within your situation to actually stop and go, hmm, I'm really hungry. Let's see what they have in their fridge. As their dead body lays in the other room. Right. But, I mean, he's also been quoted saying that blood doesn't bother him or anything like that so i mean none of this it, really faced him at all i mean i don't yeah no it couldn't have for the gory some of the things he did were extremely gory like i said the smashing the grandmother's head in which was really 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 sad and uh I, well, I, 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 even I uh 
gouged out the eyes of one of his victims. Yeah. See, he always did something a little bit different. He used all different ty types of tools and stuff. So I think that he really was just impulsive. So he worked off this weird, mm -hmm. like, impulse. Yeah. He's like, ooh, you know, if I'm feeling a certain type of way, like, I want to I wanna have sex. I'm going to go and steal a kid. Right? He would steal kids and, and, and then release them, too, which was really messed up. Really, mm -hmm. really messed up. Because a lot yeah. of those kids, yeah, he never killed them. He just let them, you know, go. But then they're still dealing with their post, like PTSD from that. Um, I mean, there was one child who was not so lucky. Oh, yeah. No, I, I do remember that. That's true. That's true. She was nine. Yeah. But for the most part, that's what he would do. And mostly he would go in, he'd shoot the male and then kind of mess with the female and it's almost like he let the females go in most of those situations he would just like rape them or whatever and go because there was a lot of survivors that were females but the males nah uh but he definitely kind of went in rampage rambo didn't really have a plan i know there was one point where he stopped murdering someone or like going with what he had planned not planned but like what he was he was what he was going to do to them because something with the electrical cord sparked and he thought it was uh, something from God. So he ran. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, dude, like you're on another level. But then, so when you get to a certain, he got to a certain point, I think Serena, that he was right. He was killing off the of impulse and basically feeding his need to kill rape and have control and, uh, steal, you know, these children and just all these sick things he was doing. Mm. But but then I think he started feeding off the fact that he was getting kind of. I don't want to say famous, but I mean, what can I say? He started like be, becoming the Night Stalker, the, the like unstoppable. They couldn't find him. It took him forever to find this guy. Isn't that something you said you well, were upset about? You're like, why uh, did it take so long? The shoe prints, all this stuff. It's not so the... much how long it took. It was the fact that he should have been caught right. when he went to the G Dang dentist. Yes, I agree. But because they decided they they needed to set up a oh secret alarm button, that I yeah. just feel like it was someone being lazy and didn't want to fully set up the button. So they oh, just made you. the pretty red button and didn't wire it to where it actually worked. So yeah. and the doctors Ramirez there like... ended up getting away once yes. again. And it was just like, it... are you freaking serious? How did you not yeah. just have an officer or two inside the dental office? You knew he had a good chance of coming back. How did you just not go? All right, you can have your button, but we're also going to have officers hidden somewhere right because the seriousness just of this situation something exactly i agree because when it it was to the point where he had they were really needing to find him because it was getting crazy bad uh with how many people he was killing he was getting just crazy and ruthless and he thought he was just basically unstoppable so at that point uh, <laughs> You know, they should have taken it more serious than putting a damn button in there. Like, seriously. And then the doctor getting a hold of the police saying, hey, I was trying to uh, hit the button. Where were you guys at? He was just in here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, and in the documentary, I believe I remember one of the detectives that was on the case talking about how his initial thought was great. Now, how many more deaths are we going to have now because this button failed? Yeah. You put all of your faith into a G dang little red button. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> look now, what I got you. Right. Yeah. Like, I just, it, I guess it, I don't get the concept because I wasn't alive in the 80s. But come on. Like, it, no. Honestly, let's do some comparing and contrasting real quick here on that point you just said. In the 80s, technology sucked. Right. And I, yeah. And I, and, but I feel, so they shouldn't have relied on it in my opinion, but, and, and they should have had people in there, like you said, 100%. But even now, like if there's like a mass murderer that they're really, really like needing to find this guy because there's no doubt he's going to kill again, which obviously he did. Uh, they would, they would right now, they would put 
they would keep people in there. They wouldn't rely on technology and technology is way freaking better than it was back then. So eh, there, there's that thought, food for thought on that one. So yeah, they fluked up big time, in my opinion, mm -hmm. big time. No, I definitely agree with that. He yeah. knew he was going to probably come back to fix his teeth because, uh, yeah. I mean, he had some serious messed up infection. teeth from, yeah, the infections. And I'm mm -hmm. sure the LSD and stuff did not help at all. Yikes. But wasn't he on more drugs too? Like, wasn't he doing some harder stuff though? Oh, or am I'm I... sure he did. I believe he had talked about, I want to say cocaine, yeah. maybe. Okay, that would make sense. I was reading some of his quotes last night, and I think he had touched on his love for cocaine. Yeah. This Don't guy was quote a me on that. Right. Right. I thinking. mean, no, like I said earlier. Like... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Go, go. Like I said earlier, his cousin did such a freaking number on him. And then his sister's husband was no help in the fact because... Uh, his older sister, Ruth, her husband, Roberto, was a peeping Tom who took Richard along on his nightly exploits. So, I mean, Ramirez, when he got into LSD and just the company that he was around, it was insane. And something else that really just ticked me off was, can we talk for a second about how his cousin was found not guilty for murdering his wife by reason of insanity? The dude oh, only served I four know. years in a mental hospital in Texas, but no, had probably the biggest influence over Ramirez. And mm -hmm. then, you know, Ramirez grows up. He has his sexual fantasies with violence. Yep. Drops out of school. I mean, he was Kids just he was set up for failure. He was, and his cousin dug his teeth in right at the right time where he was probably the most impressionable. Yeah. And I really think he was just, once again, kind of set up for failure. He just kind of was shrugged off, I guess. I mean, he yeah. influenced him in the sense of being a creep, but his cousin... No. Oh, well, what was, who was the one that, like, kept girls' heads off and did weird shit? Like, or, the like, showed him pictures? The cousin. The one that oh. I... Was Oh, but he didn't actually do that stuff. He just was showing him pictures. No, he did that stuff. Oh, shit. Wait, so was he in the... Was he, like... Serving? His cousin was a decorated Green Beret combat veteran. He was part of the Vietnam War. Now, when Ramirez was younger, his cousin took his experiences... And was boasting about, you know, the gruesome exploits and abuses from the war because no war is pretty. And I think the Vietnam probably is one of the most gruesome just for the fact that a lot of people did rape and kill. And his cousin was one of them. He shared well, Polaroid pictures that he had of his victims there, the no. Vietnamese women that he had raped, some of the photos, he was posing with the severed head of a woman he had abused. I mean, yeah. So Mira's was just insanely impressionable. His sister's husband didn't help with the whole peeping Tom thing. But I mean, his cousin, in my opinion, definitely should have served more than four years in a mental hospital. But well, yeah, his for cousin. Sure decided that he needed to be taught some of his military skills. No young boy should be taught anything like that, especially from a Green Beret, where your number one thing you want to teach someone is how to kill kill with stealth. Like, seriously. Yeah. He don't need to know that. No, not at all. He didn't need to see all. those pictures. No, he's, it's almost like his cousin was, like, glorifying it. I think it's just absolutely saddening that Ramirez, like, you know, is what at this young age, 11, 12, whatever, and his cousin, like the person he's probably closest to, right? Because, right? like, what else? Yeah. Who else does he have? And yeah, that's, I mean, they're glorifying it. He's glorifying it. Like, this is his escape. This is the one thing he knows, right? Like, 
So it's going to well, leave a number on this kid, especially with head yeah. injuries, doing drugs later on. I mean, <laughs> another one that wasn't set up for success. Wasn't raised by the system, by all means, but <laughs> definitely comparable. The people around him, childhood. he would have, no offense, but he probably would have been better off in the system, sadly to uh, say. But, you know, it well, would have at least saved him from the people he was around. Just like with Manson, what they should, what these people need is to just be in a like an environment that can help them thrive rather than in a boy school or in a juvenile place or in a jail somewhere else to at least set them up, up for success. Like, come on right. now. Come on. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so frustrating. Yeah. I mean, he dropped out of school in the ninth grade. You would have thought somebody would have looked into that. Like, you know, right. This boy Why is sneaking they? away to go sleep in a cemetery just to escape his dad and his dad's abuse. Literally, yep. Where if something like that happened in today's society, CPS or something is gonna be right there on that booty trying to figure the situation yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where was all this back then? Because I'm sorry, children back then were just as were and are just as important as kids today. Wasn't like, it developed. should never Apparently. have changed. Right. Because, yep. I'm sorry, if someone's going to drop out in ninth grade, you would think you would just look into that. Just a little bit. I Yeah. I'm pretty sure that if you, like, in this day and time, if you don't go to school or show up for school, your parents can get in trouble. Like, you mm -hmm. could get in trouble if your kids don't go to school. Like, in the 60s, they should have done that. Like, but also in the 60s, my dad... He was born in 1964. He was able to quit school. He was able to yeah. quit school in, like, junior high. So that's right. a problem. Yeah, I mean, a problem I guess of back the, then the they age. definitely didn't look at school the way they try to shove it down your throat now. Now? Uh-huh. Even though, I mean, I don't like, feel like most schools really teach you the proper <laughs> things that you need to know to survive in this day and age taxes stuff like that no they don't yeah they sure don't yeah no i agree but, but like they were pretty lax this, back then because it's huh but this kid needed some structure back then i mean yeah i just i feel like someone should have reached out just someone somewhere it seemed like his I, family just sucked in general so there was like nobody yeah. knew what was going on behind closed doors so he was just like left to basically all this i mean <laughs> he just came from a cesspool of misfits that just yeah. kind of drug him down. Yeah. And, you know, like, just another point to touch on very, very, very ever so briefly is that uh, going back to, like, the uh, the time and place of when this all, like, happened and stuff, they probably valued, like, just working rather than going to school. Like, working was, like, t priority. Kids would quit school. Like, little boys would quit school to, like, take care of their family. Especially if, like, their father died or something like that. So now that wouldn't be that way. Thank thank goodness we've changed for the better in that aspect. But anyway, so he basically got away with murder for... At least it wasn't a super duper long time. I know there was... It's all in, like, 1984. Then uh, Okay. 85. 19, yep. So basically it was all 1985 really but he did one in 1984 which was a woman called jenny vincow he raped and murdered her so that was the only one he did in 1984 uh not necessarily oh really? that was actually okay. not his first murder his first murder he wasn't actually um held accountable for until 2009 because his dna matched a sample that they had obtained from the crime scene but it was actually oh. that nine-year-old chinese american girl and Lord yep. help me, I'm probably going to mess up her name, but I would say May Long, Ling. But May. yeah, uh, she was living in San Francisco and he raped and beat her before stabbing her to death. And he hung her body from a pipe in the basement of a hotel that he was living in at the time. Okay, that's right. That's right. Yep. So she and technically was his first murder, which was in April of 84. So there were two that year, but like I said, he wasn't accused and held accountable for that one until 2009. When they had better resources. Yeah. Got to match that up. Yeah. D 
DNA and all well, that stuff actually became easier to process. Yeah. And back then it was harder because they, with, with fingerprints, they even had to look at it manually and kind of decipher with their own eyes and their best judgment on if a fingerprints basically matched rather than what today's like all digital and yada, yada and all that stuff. So they like, it was just harder because they had to do it uh, manually, all this stuff, <clears throat> all this stuff manually. I, it's just, I'm glad they got them when they got them because it, from what I understand, just watching him in an interview this is why i say he's a douchebag because he just literally doesn't care and he seems very wishy-washy like a wannabe in a way i'm sorry like i I think i think so i was gonna say i'm sorry but why would i be i think i think that (laughs) i really think he is because the 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 interviewer's like so basically asking him questions like uh what's the point and stuff and he goes (laughs) like like i'm not gonna answer it kind of like no comment (laughs) And he's like, uh, we're all just murder. We're all the government's a bigger murderer than I don't know. I'm butchering his quote, basically. But OK, but with that quote, though, I don't feel he was exactly wrong. He's not. He's not. I but do again, think, though, how is for... he making it better? <laughs> I mean, he's not. But I do feel for someone who dropped out of school at the ninth grade level and suffered the head traumas that he did, I do feel he was actually smart. Like, he had a very good understanding of the world. You're right. I don't know if I'd say the world, but, like, he just had a very good understanding. And a lot of the quotes that I've read of his just, to me, made sense in a certain way. Right, right. It's like the Manson thing where it's kind of they're they have this certain um thing about them that's they they just they're smart. They see the world for kind of what it is in a way. They kind of break the mold too. Like mm-hmm. they don't agree with things that probably we shouldn't all agree with either. I get that. Yeah. So he was kind of slamming the government and saying how the government does that with the wars that we've had and stuff like that. And I, and yes, I totally agree with him. But I also think it's pretty messed up that he got the thrill. Like he got this certain type of thrill. Like he craved, he needed to kill people. And that's unfortunate that he had that trait. Like a very weird, uh, what it would it be? Like sociopathic trait or something well um he actually there was a psychiatrist uh that went by the name of michael stone he said that he described ramirez as a made psychopath which is what we've talked about he was not a born psychopath he was a made one because i mean the trauma that he went through growing up it definitely pointed him down the wrong road he was not just someone who was born into a wonderful family a upstanding citizen that you know lived a secret life where he was just born to be bad i feel like he was just made based on his surroundings and everything so i agree with the psychiatrist there but he also says that ramirez had schizoid personality disorder which contributed to his indifference to the suffering of his victims is and his untreatability so um you know, all of his head trauma and everything, it definitely did not help matters by any means. So, mm, no, the fact that he was, he had a personality disorder that, like, okay, I'm looking at kind of the definition of schizoid personality disorder. And it says that it's a personality disorder can characterized wow by a lack of interest (laughs) in social relationships or a tendency toward a solitary or sheltered lifestyle secretiveness emotional coldness detachment and apathy so i mean right there pretty much sums up everything you said so i would credit his personality disorder to why he just did not have empathy and things like that towards his victims well and then that one chick she was talking about how when he was raping her he she said she explained his look 
He was looking at her as if he was almost sorry or regretful or guilty, but also in that same light, mm, but I'm still going to do this to you anyway. So almost like a de determination, but like, I'm sorry, but I'm determined to do this kind of look kind of thing. Like and the, so I, I'm sorry, I'm, but hey, I've got to do this. This is I what I it. came here to do. So I'm sorry right. that it sucks for you, but hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I need this. I literally can't go living without this. Because if you think about it, this guy didn't function normally, obviously. He, like, basically just lived off of wanting to kill people. Well, uh, uh, I don't, well. Before that, I mean, I don't know what he was doing before 1984, though. So I can't, I don't know what to, I can't really say that. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, there's this, um, Dr. Todd Grande is the one I watched. And uh, it's a 25-minute video, but it kind of, he kind of explains his take on the Night Stalker's mental health, Richard's mental health. Mm-hmm. Says this video answers the question, can I analyze the mental health and personality characteristics of Richard Ramirez, otherwise known as the Night Stalker? Richard Ramirez was a serial killer who was active in California from June 1984 until August 1985. Ramirez was convicted of 13 murders. However, it is believed he was responsible for many more. In addition to the Night Stalker, he was also referred to as the walk-in killer. That was the first one, wasn't it? But before they, like, changed it up. Uh, he had two other nicknames, the walk-in killer and the valley intruder. Yeah. Boom. There it is. Yeah. Valley intruders on here, on, on here too. So he goes on to say just really quick, since we're talking about like his mental health and things like that, Serena. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so he goes, antisocial personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder in the uh, diagnostic and statistical manual. It has seven symptom criteria, three of which are required for diagnosis. So the seven is one is repeated unlawful behaviors, two consistent deceitfulness, Three, impulsive, impulsivity, poor planning. That sounds a lot like him, by the way. Mm -hmm. Four, aggressiveness, physical fights. Five, reckless disregard for safety. Six, consistent irresponsibility. And seven, lack of remorse. Narcissistic personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder in the diagnostic and statistical manual. It has nine symptom criteria, five of which are required for a diagnosis. One is the grandiose sense of self-importance. So he thought he was uh, an agent from the devil. He started writing like pentagons. He started like writing on people pentagrams. too. Pentagrams. Oh, pentagrams. Oh my gosh, whatever. Pentagram. <laughs> I almost want to cut that out so I don't sound too stupid. Pentagrams. Grams. Okay, I was about to say pentagon again. Okay. So when he would do the pentagrams on, on like the forehead to people or on the walls, mainly he started doing that, I think, after he started getting uh, like pretty uh, quote unquote unquote popular, whatever. Especially after um, he got caught. I saw like that he things. was um, referencing Manson a little bit with the pentagrams. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like he glorified and looked up to even like Ted Bundy, too. So, uh, two is fantasies for this whole narcissistic personality disorder in Cluster B. So, one is the grandoise, grandoise sense of self-importance. Two is fantasies. Three is special or unique. Four is requires excessive admiration. Five is sense of entitlement. Six, manipulative. Seven, lack empathy for others. Eight, often envious. Nine, arrogant attitudes or behaviors. Uh, so, yeah, and then he just goes on to refer, um, like, kind of source those because he's you know, credible and all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, so I don't know. Basically, that's what he had to say about it. Just like he's like narcissistic and like narcissistic cluster B and then uh, antisocial personality disorder as well. So but then what you said makes sense, too. It's really all like it all just makes sense. This guy is just is a little off the ringer. And, and we touched base on why we think that could very well be childhood and all this other stuff. So, you know, it just kind of baffles me that someone in my opinion who's just so terrible because none of these people deserved any of what happened to them especially the extent of kind of yeah how far to the extent them. of what he did like yeah. and i mean i know i'm just going to touch on this real fast but 
a lot of people are upset with Netflix because of how far they went with the documentary on him. But I just have to say that there should have been a full disclosure warning because I'm sorry, it is a documentary on someone who did commit her horrific, atrocious acts to people. Mm. So maybe they just needed to put a warning because this man did unimaginable things to some people. I mean, most of them. Like one woman, her, I want to say her young son, I thought he was like three. Uh, yeah, three-year-old son was tied up into the bedroom as his mom was being raped by Ramirez. Um, he ended up not killing either one of them, but nope. just things like that. That poor three-year-old was, was probably traumatized. I mean, that was back in 85, so this boy is what? Getting ready to be like 35? I don't know. My math is terrible, guys. Hold on, 1985? Yeah. What'd you say? That he 30? would be like 35? You're totally right. Oh, right on. cool. You're right. My math yeah. is not terrible tonight. You're right on the money. But you can't tell me that as a 35-year-old, he's still not haunted by that image. I mean, that's traumatizing for anyone to see. So, yeah. you know, I do feel... Maybe Netflix needed to provide a warning when talking about something so horrific as the person that is Richard Ramirez. But um, I even asked you because you had watched it and I said, is there any kids in here? Because I was like, I'd get triggered. So, yeah. Right. And I mean, just the fact that this man literally was convicted of 13 counts of murder Five counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, 14 counts of burglary, and his penalty was 19 death sentences. That says something about a person. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this man was just evil, I guess. Yeah, his eyes were like black and dark and people were like creeped out. He just had that vibe about him. When I watched the interview, he's just like, he seemed so full of himself. So I can see where that grandiose or grandose, like feeling like he's better than what he is kind of thing. I I can see that. But at the same time, wasn't Manson the same way though? I feel like he was more so. Uh, This guy, uh, Richard was more so. But Manson, yeah, I could definitely see that with him too, for sure. No, he but he sure did pull the female attention. He did. That's why I wanted to get to, too. In the, uh, he loved that. He ate the shit up. He loved all of the popularity that came from it during it, like, during the killings. It, like, gave him more oomph to do it. That's why he started, like, doing, you know, those tributes and stuff to, like, Manson and things, like you were saying. And then, like, when he was in court, women were, like, in the courtroom with him. Like, that wanted him some of that piece of that d well and what baffles me is the fact that even while in prison he got married okay so yeah like i explain like okay yeah no okay i have fascination with serial killers i love learning about this stuff and like the psychology of it yeah the psychology of it and everything And I like reading the autopsy reports and things like that. I don't know. I guess I'm twisted in a sense. But no, not, to this, not to this extent where I would actually be throwing mm. myself at the feet of a convicted murderer. Like, to me, that's just crossing a whole nother line and a whole code of ethics that just you shouldn't do. Like, I get it being fascinated with the stuff, but I'm never going to go out and actually try to recreate or become one myself, ever. That ha- I have no interest in that. I just, I like the psychology aspect of this mm-hmm. stuff. So, the fact that there, her name was Doreen. He ended up marrying her in 96. They got married in San Quentin, which is where he was at the time. She, it's in so 85, stupid. wrote him nearly 75 letters. And then he turned around and proposed in 88. 
Like, how do you fall in love with a serial killer? I bet if he had a chance, he'd kill her. <laughs> to be honest, if he was out, he'd kill her. Because this guy well, just doesn't seem straight, like, at all. Like, point that she said that if he was executed, that she was going to commit suicide. Like, how are you just so infatuated with a person that you're that extreme? Especially right. someone who did such heinous things. But I do give her some credit because when it came out in 2009 that he actually did kill that nine-year-old Chinese-American girl, she actually did leave him. So Over that? I, yeah, over <laughs> that. The fact that he was accused and convicted of killing a nine-year-old child. So, I mean, I give her some credit there that she at least did have enough goal to leave him. Yeah, but what about all the ones he raped? Right. That's, oh my gosh. But yeah. no, I get what you're saying. It I get it. It makes sense. In that, if you look at it that way, it just doesn't make sense. But at least she did have some kind of brain up there that she was just like, okay. That's enough crossing enough. the line. Yeah. Right. He did actually kill a child, so I'm out. But yeah. what's sad is it didn't stop there. He was actually engaged in 2013 to, I want to say she was 23, but her name was Christine Lee. He got engaged again. Oh, my gosh. So, I really, really <sighs> just want to know, and maybe some of our listeners can shine some light or give us some feedback, or like your guys' opinion on the situation. What would make someone, or what would trigger someone to go... I love this serial killer in the sense that you would actually want to be in a physical relationship with this person that you know yeah. firsthand has raped, murdered, and burglarized tons of people. Primarily women. And half the people that, or half the women that were sending him, pi sending him pictures of themselves, like half naked, he'd probably do the same thing to you. I'm just saying. And he's probably fantasizing about that. Like, oh, I would love to like just wring her neck. Probably. So, Serena, it's called hybristophilia, and it's a it's a sexual arousal uh, and whatever an attainment of orgasm that's responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner known to have committed a, a known crime such as rape or murder. So it's like women. That's like a thing that just you obsess. Okay, so over. women get off on the. Okay, got it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Literally, oh, they yeah. get off on it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also saw somewhere where uh, some of the women were, uh, or they were saying that they think that a part of it was because he's, they get confused with the whole, uh, like, famous and celebrity part of it. So they think that it's just, yeah. So probably mixed with that weird hybrid. So kind of like the infatuation I guess, of the celebrity of it. Because, I mean, this was a high-profile case. Yep. I mean, um, it was, up until the O.J. Simpson murder case, it was the most expensive trial at that time in the history of California. So, it cost $1.8 at the time of his trial in 89 to have his entire case... Now, in 2019, that $1.8 million translates to $3.71 million that went into that case. So, the fact that his case cost that much, and then to mm. find that he was surpassed by O.J. Simpson just makes you wonder how much O.J. Simpson's murder case cost. But, right. you know, he was a high-profile case, so mm -hmm. I guess maybe the celebrity and infatuation of seeing him in pictures and on the news constantly. The fact that he was so sly that he got away for so long and did all these little uh, pieces of like, haha, you can't catch me putting, writing stuff on the walls and the victim's blood kind of stuff. Like, right. I'm so smart. I outsmarted all of you kind of thing. Well, and uh, it didn't help that... Uh, he ended up finding out from San Francisco's mayor at the time. She, 
was actually giving away information in a press conference yep. and all this stuff infuriated mm. the detectives. I mean, they were well, yeah, because this was stuff that no one yeah. knew. And the fact that he's watching she the gave news. this away. Exactly. He was paying yeah. attention to this. Most of them do. Because yeah. that's how they know exactly where detectives are at with the case. It, yep. And newspapers and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. He was following it hard. And they knew he was. And so, like, when he went off, because he went, he went back there, and they followed his ass over mm-hmm. there. And they shared this information with, with them. And then she decided to go ahead and just give this, you know, information out. And when they heard, when they, because they went back to their hometown and then like when they ended up finding out that she did that they're like okay well what are we going to do and didn't the one chief because they were like devastated because like this one officer was working on it for so long mm-hmm. um trying to really catch him it was like personal to him he's like really just his family was getting affected and stuff like that but didn't um yeah he was like losing hope yeah and so the chief was like he got on it and goes we have nothing on him try to like you know trick yeah him he up. tried to backtrack and everything but i mean that one little tidbit of information, mm-hmm. he ended up, because the biggest thing they had at that point was his footprint. He always yep. seemed to leave a footprint at the crime scene. And yep. the really big piece of evidence that they had was that they knew exactly what colored the shoe was. It was a black size 11 and a half a Via sneaker. They knew exactly mm-hmm. what the shoe was. And that night, after that press conference, Ramirez actually went and launched them over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge. So they lost that bit of evidence to tie him to murders and encounters that would have happened after that press conference. So he just, he knew how at that point to throw him off, but luckily it didn't work out in his favor. Well, what was hard about him was the fact that he was so sporadic. And then the car... They they almost had him again, remember? Mm-hmm. But then the car got towed. They wanted to get, try to get the fingerprint from it. It sat out in the hot sun because they couldn't get to it. Like, the place wouldn't let them have access mm-hmm. to it or something. Like, yeah. Then they finally yeah. get to it, and it's useless. Like, oh, my gosh. Yep. I mean, it was, it was a very long trying time for the detectives. And I'm just happy that they never actually gave up. Oh, jumping topic here. Did you see that in, I think it was American Horror Story, they did like a nod to the uh, Night Stalker? We actually, like a whole watched, character. Um, we actually watched season five, which is Hotel. And yeah. it is actually based off an act- a real life hotel that was located in Los Angeles. I want to say it was on Skid Row. It's called the Cecil Hotel. And it's my sister, it's her favorite season. She absolutely loves everything about Hotel. But there is a part where on Halloween, the spirits get to come and they have this dinner. Well, the dinner is full of, like, murderers, I believe, Dahmer, Eileen Wool. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to mess up her last name. Wool <laughs> Rose, I think. Good Lord. It's either Wayne Rose or... Wayne Rose or Wool Rose. I am so sorry. I am butchering her name, but I know her first name is Eileen. Um, it's her. It's Richard Ramirez. It's Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, it was probably one of my favorite scenes. And yeah. this hotel, like I said, is actually a real place. And they based it all off of that. I want to actually maybe talk about this hotel on an upcoming episode if there's people that would actually be interested in learning about mm-hmm. it because. It has a lot of dark and sinister history to it uh, because Ramirez actually is rumored to have stayed there. And I'm wondering if oh, maybe because it talks about the nine-year-old girl being murdered at a hotel that he lived at at the time. So I'm wondering if maybe that was the hotel. I don't know. I would have to do a little more research, which I would love to do for you guys. So if you want to hear us talk about the Cecil Hotel, definitely Mm -hmm. vote for it because we'll touch on that. We'll touch a little bit on American Horror Story. So if you're a fan of the show, 
Uh, oh, my geez. husband and I still have quite a bit to catch up on. We are, I think we made it to season seven. I don't remember, but we have a lot to catch up on still because he makes an appearance in season nine as well. Yeah. Well, and they got a lot of his history, right, with it too. In this, mm-hmm. per- in this, per- in this particular one. Um, hold on. American Horror Story uh, episode two delved into the backstory of Richard Ramirez. So the second episode of American Horror Story 1984 showed the backstory of real life serial killer Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, and the FX show got his childhood down to a T. Okay. Yeah, we haven't seen that yet. And okay, Eileen Warnos. I just had to double check for myself because the yeah. the movie Monster that is about her life, I actually really enjoyed. So it was gonna bug me if I didn't correct myself on her name. So yeah, it's totally Warnos. I think so I see sorry, her guys. picture. I think I see your picture in your glasses. Probably. <laughs> it's on my screen this, right now. So, yeah, they give, like, a little nod to him for that. And I looked over at Brandon and I said, oh, my gosh, they're giving this guy so much credit uh, for all the well, shit that he's done. It's crazy how many, like, I didn't realize how many different Night Stalker movies there were either. I didn't know there, that was a nod to him. And I watched that season. It was the crazy. 1984 season or 1984 like because we like... haven't made it to the ninth season yet um like i well, said I we've watched hotel and we made it to i skipped hotel isn't that with lady gaga in it sadly she okay, was my yeah. least favorite Wait. part of that season oh for sorry real. We'll guys if in. i catch crap for that i'm sorry Maybe we could do that on a Pop Culture Tuesday just because it is a TV show yeah. and there are so many different seasons. No, yeah, I agree. That Yeah, for sure. And then we can talk about my love for uh, Ryan or Evan Peters. I don't know why I was Oh saying my goodness. I can't tell you how many <laughs> pictures or little meme things I have been sent of Evan Peters thanks to my sister. That girl. Peyton oh my back goodness. Off. Peyton? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I guess Evan I'll share. Peters Ugh. is her life when it comes to American Horror Story. Oh, I love Evan Peters in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay, Peyton. He's definitely a great actor in it, and I love his work in it, but I'm definitely what not on say? the level that you guys are. Whatever, because you're not cool. You're not on <laughs> I the I guess school. not. <laughs> I was thankful for Matt Bomber to be in season five, though, of Hotel. Matt Bomber? Because I like Matt Matt Bomber. And for he's one of those that's openly gay and everything, which, awesome to him. But so when I see Matt Bomber and things, I'm like, yay, Matt Bomber. Even my mom thinks he's highly attractive. He is. I'm looking at his pictures right now, and he seems familiar. What, What did he play? Who did he play? Because I honestly, uh, it's, so faded. it's so faded. In season and I know we're five, off track, was but... uh, Lady Gaga's love interest or like little oh, never... boy toy thing. Never mind. He doesn't look familiar in that regard then because I skipped the whole hotel thing. I, like I skipped that whole one for some reason. I mean, he had a show on USA called White Collar. Yeah, I feel like I've seen, I've definitely seen him somewhere. Um, he like, was I a have. Magic Mike. Oh, okay, maybe that might be, actually. Because I did dive into a little bit of that. I've only seen the first movie. <laughs> I never made it past I, Magic Mike. <laughs> no, I I just got on YouTube and basically got some recaps. Did you see me glitch out and you glitch out? Yeah, I wondered what the heck that was. Yeah, look. Hold on, wait. Okay, for a second, you got all uh, glitchy, too. All right. Um, Do you feel like Reef... T- well, okay. Uh, We just need to circle back and talk about his death and then... Yes. And how he got um, caught in the community. Yeah. We need to talk about his being catch, being caught, and his death. (laughs) Yeah. Being catched. Oh, my Lord. We need to go back and then talk about that being catch, boy. (laughs) I love you. I love you. (laughs) His being caught, touch on his trial, and then his death. And then we can wrap him up. Yeah, let's wrap him up in a ugly little bow. <laughs> right, <laughs> the worst bow fun. ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, so let me pull him back up because to be honest, I watched all the stuff. I binged uh, all the information about him. But to be honest, I feel like it's like a short-term memory th- or whatever it's called. But it just went <laughs> bye-bye. Like it literally like I was like, uh, wait, what? Okay. Uh, I even like I even like forgot his name well, for a second. Like, oh my gosh. Even when I was doing my research, I got really sidetracked with where I was going with it. Joe and I had a t- conversation about him last night that was completely what? off, like, the topic of just talking about him and the case and everything. Because uh, we were talking about how he believed in Satanism and we just got on this whole, like, on the Satanism religion. Like the religion and- of it. Yeah, yeah, so we talked about that. We were talking about I, pantheism and just different religions and stuff like that and their beliefs. So I talked to Brandon about stuff like that too. Uh, yeah, I. So you got sidetracked big time. I've dived into yeah. that whole world. I've dived into that whole world, like like researching and finding out all this stuff. And to be honest, it's not as scary. Like if you're saying no, it's Satan, really it's, not. It's, no, it's like kind of not. You're just like you're just like set in your own ways and you don't believe in anything really i mean it's just like whatever it's not like scary but they really Richard just Romero. believe in eye for an eye like they yes. have yes rules that they follow as well and it's a lot of people hear satanism and they go oh my gosh you worship the devil that's not yeah. exactly true you know that's why not exactly that? what it is you know why they do that because of people like richard uh ramirez I keep wanting to say Hernandez because of Richard Ramirez, people like him. He was trying to say that he was an agent of uh, the devil and all this stuff. That's why I think he's well, kind of and he douchey. did keep saying like hail Satan and everything like that. So in I the mean, court, uh huh. Yes. Oh my god. Honestly, I laughed at that because I was like, that is so piddly. He seems like such a coward. I'm sorry. He is such a coward. Like he'd go after like uh, women, kids. He'd shoot the husbands right away. He's a coward. Like old women, and then in the courtroom, if you watch that clip, he's like, "Hell, Satan!" <laughs> like it's so piddly. Like I wasn't even scared at that point. Yes, he looks scary, and I wouldn't want to be in the same room with him because he's like dead, cold, weird eyes. But at the same time, coward. I mean, well, when it comes down to it, and it's kind of funny though that you know he was able to get a metal detector installed in the courthouse because he had been overheard saying that he was going to shoot the prosecutor with a gun so the courthouse actually went as far as installing a metal detector because he had heard by um prison guards that he was going to actually shoot the prosecutor where does he think i want to get him anyway Right. I mean, you're already I, in jail. I mean, I guess he has uh, nothing to lose if he's already in custody. Right. But like that just shows how effed up his morals are. Like, OK, he can be like this, you know, this type, this type of smart that I can't put my finger on, whatever that him and Manson had, like the way they look at the world and society. Sure. But then he has this like stupidity about him. That's like, what's the point of that, dude? Like, yeah. OK, you kill him. Yes, you get in trouble. But also, like, what's the point? Because I mean. It doesn't matter what judge is sitting up there. You're right. You're in trouble. Kill that judge. There's going to be another one. <laughs> like you've got nothing to lose, but still like, well, one of his jurors it. actually ended up being murdered at the time of his case. And they were trying oh, to yeah. say that it was due to Ramirez. And if he had somehow, like gotten into someone's head and they actually killed her but it turned out that it was her boyfriend who actually later committed suicide with the same weapon that he used to kill her in a hotel but uh gotcha i didn't know that all the jurors were heightened like the jury was terrified which they had every right to be because up until it was determined that her boyfriend had killed her it could have been someone on Ramirez's side, and they all could have had targets on their back. Yeah, look at Manson. People were out killing for him while he was in in trial and stuff, right? Kind of the same ordeal, really. 
it, what's really gross about Ramirez too is that when he was sitting in the courtroom, you could see like he was like looking at the camera, like smug and um, again that grandiose, grandiose. I hope I'm saying that right. And if I'm not, I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying, but yeah, he's just like looking because he knew that he had women go like ah uh, over him. Mm-hmm. So he'd look at the camera and be like, whatever, uh, just sickening. After everything he's done, it's just sickening. So, uh, it, oh, and there was this one story where this lady, she, you know, she was a victim of him, a survivor, and uh, she, no, her grand, it was her grandmother, the one that I talked to earlier in this episode about him smashing her head in, which I hate mm-hmm. saying that because it sounds so ruthless to say, but it's just fact of the matter kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's any way to say that kind, another way to say that uh, lightly. But uh, uh, anyway, so she was in there and then she, it was too much for her. So she went out and sat outside of the courtroom and she was mm. sitting by this. Right, right, right. You remember mm-hmm. now, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. this guy. Yeah. He was like crying and stuff. And then she realized he was like crying because she he, he had like a pentagon on his hand. So he had a fault for too. Pen- oh, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> the pentagon's the building it's right? still a shape in a shape still a shape it counts i mean anyway so she realized <laughs> that. but this is how like inescapable some of his victims felt right mm-hmm. and here he is on the other spectrum the other side of things just smiling and smirking at the camera so how did he get put away or like no like how did he die refresh refresh my memory um Sadly, he died uh, oh, from cancer. I know, cancer. Richard Ramirez, the serial killer known as the Night Stalker, is dead. The California Department of Corrections said Ramirez died of natural causes today in a hospital after spending more than two decades on death row. Cancer. Such an odd death. Instead of staying in a box for decades and decades, he only stayed in a box relatively short time kind of a blessing more than he gave his victims Mm. because um Mm. he was awaiting his sentence which he was sentenced to die in the gas chamber but you know he uh pretty much just spent his time on death row waiting until b-cell lymphoma took over and he yeah. died on June seventh of twenty thirteen. So I mean, he had been on death row for more than twenty three years, but that's still just that's not a lot of time if you think about it for everything he did, every life he erased, and every life he basically screwed up. Because I can't forget, I live with it every day. Our our ministry has taught us to look at all the happy memories. We talk about grandma to the kids and to the great grandkids now who never knew her. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not. And the way he went is almost way too peaceful. Way too peaceful. Yeah. He caused on people. Okay. Yeah. He was 53 at the time that he passed, but it says right here that he would have, it's estimated that he would have been in his early 70s before his execution was carried out. So, in my opinion, What's the he point? Just, right, <laughs> he had it way too easy. Just mm. the acts that he committed and everything, they are very unspeakable, unforgivable. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Netflix documentary, definitely go do so if you want to learn more and mm. um, just be prepared. I didn't feel like it was as graphic as others think, but I also have a different degree of what I can tolerate gore wise yeah. than some other people may have, obviously, because Netflix has yeah. received some hate for this documentary. Wow. But uh no, I definitely feel like I do think he was intelligent in a sense, but that does not justify or rectify the things that he did. Um, 
the murders he committed, the rapes he committed, none of that can be justified at all. He no. was definitely born into a really crappy family and was, again, set up for failure, in my opinion, anyway. Which is the so, sad part of it. Yeah. It really is. Um, Thinking of a kid going through that, that pulls my heartstrings for sure. These people's lives will never be the same. They will never get them back. Their families have been completely traumatized by the things that he's done. And again, none of it can ever be justified, rectified, or just made sense of. So no. I definitely want to send my condolences out to the families. Yes. Um, I know the Netflix series is probably hard to watch, but, you know, bravo to you guys for allowing that stuff to happen and people to be educated on what you guys went through. I know it's probably triggering and hard to relive. And that definitely takes a lot of heart to get up in front of a camera and actually tell your story. Yeah. So I definitely want to applaud the survivors. It's just a hard thing to cover, but he definitely was a very malicious, horrible person. Well, he was the agent of the devil, Serena. Oh, that's true. He was. <laughs> I so. mean, so with that, guys, we are going to close out this episode of Can't Be Influenced, our Finister Sunday series. Our polls will be up. Serena and I are going to go discuss some uh, poll options and hope that you guys uh, like them and suggest what we should put on the polls. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will catch you in our next Sinister Sunday. <laughs> Bye, guys.